going to be a bit of a canter through this morning because the topic is quite uh, wide and we're trying to cover everything in relation to the Athens Convention from uh, basic to some of the more difficult case law. Um, so necessarily there will be aspects that we skate over a little bit. Um, do ask us questions about those if you have a particular question that you want us to answer in relation to that. And next week we will do the same thing all over again uh, with the Montreal Convention. Um, the way we're going to structure it is that I am going to start with a couple of slides. Andrew is then going to give you the benefit of his extensive experience with some of the more difficult um, practical issues around the, the convention issues on exclusivity, issues on limitation and so on. And then I will come back and talk a little bit about the, uh, the meat of it in relation to accidents um, and what types of accidents you can recover for. Um, and then we will just do a little bit of practical stuff and then take some questions at the end. So that's the structure of it this morning. Um, I think, yep, yeah, it's five past 11, so I think we'll get cracking. Um, in relation to um, the convention as regards uh, Brexit, which is the thing that everyone is now asking us about now that Brexit is coming ever closer, um, it is enforced by reason of a EU regulation which gives effect to the modified convention, modified by the 2002 protocol. Um, if we leave Europe without a deal, we will probably revert to the pre-regulation position and the convention would therefore remain in force but a slightly different version of it. Um, so if we achieve a deal, we'll continue um, with what we have at the moment, which is the convention being enforced by reason of European regulation. If we crash out with no deal, um, then we just revert to the Merchant Shipping Act, um, which means that the provisions of the convention itself are going to be important to us for some time to come. It is a freestanding um, convention, by which I mean that it's um, entirely self-contained. What does it apply to? Well, it applies to carriage of people by sea. So it only applies where there is a contract for carriage of uh, people, of, of passengers or people accompanying vehicles or live animals. Um, we will talk a little bit about the Hague Visby rules later, which cover the carriage of goods by sea. But the Athens Convention is only about um, situations where you have a carriage of uh, a, a contract of carriage. It's not those cases where you've got someone who is on the vessel pursuant to a contract of employment. So, for example, crew members, um, independent contractors who are contracted um, to come onto the vessel. There are two cases about that, um, Scottish cases, Fellows and Cairns, um, which confirm that that's the case, that in, in, in the case of, I think Fellows is a police officer on a helicopter, he's not there um, as a, any kind of uh, pleasure cruise, he's not there pursuant to a contract for the carriage of a passenger. He's there pursuant to his contract of employment. Um, so it's only in relation to those people. You don't have to worry about it in relation to crew. Um, in relation to applicability, the regime only applies to international carriage by sea. That's the first uh, thing to note. So it doesn't cover riverboats. It also doesn't cover hovercraft, except that the UK has extended it to our domestic waters. So it does cover, in our case, things like the Isle of Wight Ferry, which is not international carriage by sea, but it does, um, it, it does, it is covered because of regulations that we have extended the application of the convention. And you can see there, uh, it's where the ship is flying the flag or is registered in a member state of the EU, Contract of carriage is signed in a member state or the contract provides for the place of departure or destination to be situated within a member state. That's going to cover most cruises that we come across, except the American ones. The USA is not a signatory to the Athens Convention. They have their own very highly developed maritime law um, and they apply that. So just bear in mind that with USA cruises, if you're going to be looking at jurisdiction within England and Wales, you need to think about whether or not the cruise is covered by the convention or whether it's going to be covered by the American maritime law, which is quite different to the convention in quite a lot of uh, respects. Andrew then will tell you all about exclusivity, which again is a really, really important aspect of, of all of this. Yes, thanks, Sarah. Well, before I start, uh, it's been drawn to our attention that um, the timing of this, uh, of this webinar is particularly apt because it is World Maritime Day today. 
And I have made inquiries to find out whether there is a special greeting that we should be using. You know, when it's Christmas, we have Merry Christmas and so forth. And the, the closest that I've got is a suggestion that we should be saying ahoy there. I, I think that might be facetious, but um, if not, uh, then um, please do accept our warmest greetings on World Maritime Day. As Sarah said, um, exclusivity is a really important feature of the Athens Convention. And um, it's set out in Article 14, which uh, we've got there on the screen. And um, what the principle of exclusivity means is that where the Convention applies, uh, damages claims can only be brought under the Convention, which is subject to all of the advantages and disadvantages that that means, because um, as we'll come on to, um, there's a special limitation period. So if we're um, dealing with a case where the Convention applies and you miss the limitation period, then you're going to be in trouble. However, if the Convention applies, then the claimant is able to take advantage of the special rules relating to liability under it. The um, authority for the exclusivity of the Convention uh, comes from Sidhu and British Airways, which is a House of Lords case about the Warsaw Convention, um, and this um, reasoning applies to the Athens Convention too. One thing that is important though is that, um, as I said, where the Convention applies, uh, claims can only be brought under the Convention. And um, of course, not all claims that fall within this sort of area are subject to the Convention. So one example is um, that the Convention applies to claims against a carrier or a performing carrier, as we can see from Article 14. So if you're bringing your claim against somebody else, then uh, you're not subject to the exclusivity of the Convention. So um, claims against other parties, such as an employer, for example, may be possible outside the Convention and outside the uh, two-year limitation period. And we've got an example of that in the case of Feast that we'll be talking about later, where the claimant was injured essentially whilst on a work jolly. She sued her employer after two years, but before three years. Her claim against the employer was in time. Um, so exclusivity is very important, but don't um, ever forget that this is only the case where the convention applies, which it doesn't always do. Um, if we can move on to the next slide. The um, other issue is um, the scope of the um, convention relating to the course of the carriage. So for the convention to apply, um, the uh, accident has to have taken place in the course of the carriage. And this is a slightly more complicated concept than might first appear from the um, from those words, the course of the carriage. And this is defined in the convention in Article 1, and um, Sarah's very kindly put that up on the screen. And it's worth reading that in detail, because uh, there are provisions there about the passenger and or his cabin luggage being on board the ship or in the course of embarkation or disembarkation, or being transported by the carrier by water from land uh, to ship or vice versa. And then there's quite an important exclusion, which is that carriage does not include the period during which the passengers in a marine terminal or station or on a quay or in or on any other port installation. And um, the precise wording of this has led to quite a few arguments in the courts about whether given circumstances are or aren't in the course of carriage. For example, um, one case um, we've got up there, Lawrence and NCL, the issue there was whether transportation between ship and shore on a tender was carriage. Um, the tender was uh, being provided by a third party. A um, number of arguments were raised, one of which was this was an intermediate stop on board the cruise where the claimant was just going for the day and he wasn't travelling with his luggage on the tender. And the defendant argued that um, back in Article 1, it talks about the passenger and or his cabin luggage uh, being transported by the carrier by water from land to ship. And it was argued there that um, the luggage wasn't travelling, but the passenger was. 
and therefore it wasn't in the course of carriage. Now that argument didn't wash and um, the courts made clear that um, in that sense it applies to the passenger or the luggage and a passenger being transported by a tender is in the course of the carriage. Well, lots of accidents occur when transferring on or off a ship and this gives rise to the question, where do you draw the line between um, embarkation and disembarkation and when you are in or on any other port installation, which is part of the uh, exclusion of um, the course of carriage. And this has been considered in two different cases, um, Collins and Jennings. Now, in Collins, the claimant was on a fishing boat trip and the way that the claimant disembarked is that the ship was pulled onto the shore and um, the claimant then disembarked down some steps which were on the beach. And these were effectively a semi-permanent installation. They could be moved around, but they were in place most of the time. Um, and the claimant was injured whilst on the steps. And the question was whether that counted as being in the course of carriage or not. And um, it was held that the process of disembarkation covered the whole of the period of moving from the vessel to a safe position on the shore. And that whilst the claimant was still using equipment facilitating disembarkation, such as the steps in that case, he was still in the process of disembarking. And um, this does give rise to the issue whether the steps count as any other port installation. And at first instance, the judge said that these steps were uh, different to shore or a key um, as per the regulation. Now, it seems to me that there's a bit of a contrast here between the Collins case and the Jennings case, which is the other case on that list there. And in Jennings, the claimant slipped on a wet walkway whilst disembarking. The walkway there was a fixture of the port, it wasn't part of the ship. And in that case, it was held that the walkway was a port installation. And it does seem to me that, um, assuming that Collins and Jennings are both correctly decided, there is really quite a fine line between what is or isn't a port installation, um, meaning what is or isn't um, within the course of carriage for the purposes of the convention. And there's quite a lot of scope for argument in a given case about it. Um, and it's going to be necessary to look at the facts of a particular case quite carefully, I think. Um, the next issue I'm going to talk about is um, jurisdiction. So uh, which courts um, a claim can be brought in? And this is governed by Article 17, which is on the screen there. And Article 17 really does give uh, quite a lot of flexibility about uh, where proceedings can be brought. And essentially, uh, they can be brought in the, um, the place of domicile of the defendant, the carrier, or in the claimant's domicile. Um, provided that the defendant has a place of business and is subject to jurisdiction in that country, or they can be brought in the place where the contract of carriage was made, again, provided that the defendant has a place of business in that state and is subject to its jurisdiction. Uh, these provisions are very important because, of course, often what happens in Athens cases is that we're talking about accidents that have taken place a very long way away from the claimant's domicile and potentially on the other side of the world. And um, it is always worth um, making sure that um, jurisdiction um, rules can be met for a particular claim that's being brought here. And it's worth in all cases, I think, going back to Article 17 to make sure the court does actually have jurisdiction. Now, the next uh, issue I'm going to talk about is limitation. And I've been um, teasing a bit uh, on limitation when I was talking about um, some of the earlier issues here. Um, and I really do think that limitation is perhaps the most important feature of the Athens Convention. And certainly my experience is that um, it's something that continues to floor claims. Um, it can be a problem even in cases where liability has been admitted if, if the limitation period is still missed. Um, it is probably the biggest pitfall to the unwary 
in the Athens Convention um, context, I think. Um, and the reason is because Athens essentially has quite a strict limitation regime. And um, the time bar itself is in Article 16.1, as we have on the screen. So the limitation period is two years from the date of disembarkation or death, whichever is later. So you need to look at when the passenger actually got off um, the ship. Um, so because it's a two year limitation period, it's basically a year less than the normal limitation for personal injury claims, except that the reference point is the date of disembarkation, not necessarily the date of injury, and they may not be the same. Um, it is still possible to make a standstill agreement. And um, if you are uh, a claimant and liability has been admitted and you're discussing quantum and you're going to have to issue, that is one way to deal with the situation. Um, that's in Article 16.4. And there's also a section that provides for suspension and interruption of the limitation period under Article 16.3. And these are concepts which um, we in this jurisdiction are not particularly familiar with, uh, suspension and interruption of the limitation period. And uh, there have been some quite creative attempts to get round the two year limitation period by arguing that various provisions of English law essentially constitute suspension and interruption, enabling the courts to be more lenient for claims which have been brought out of time. And the first case I want to talk about on that is Higham and Stenner Sealing. And that's a particularly unfortunate case because the limitation period was only just missed in that case by a few weeks. The uh, claim was issued a few weeks after the second anniversary of the disembarkation. And in that case, the, court, uh, the claimant invited the court to uh, disapply the limitation period under Section 33 of the Limitation Act. Um, seems a perfectly reasonable thing to try and do, given that the courts have this discretionary power in personal injury claims. Now, the difficulty this faced is that um, the limitation period is strict in the Convention. Um, there is a provision there about suspension and interruption, but as the Court of Appeal made clear, Section 33 of the Limitation Act does not provide for suspension or interruption of the limitation period. Uh, it provides for disapplication of the whole limitation period if the court wants to do so. And the Court of Appeal in that case held that uh, Section 33 wasn't the sort of thing that um, Article 16.3 was concerned with and that it could not be used to disapply the two-year Athens Convention limitation period. So what that means is, if the limitation period has been missed, then you can't use Section 33 of the Limitation Act to try and get round it. Um, this means that even in a case where the claimant has only just missed the limitation period, and perhaps liability has been admitted and there's no prejudice uh, to the defendant, those considerations are irrelevant because um, the time limit has passed and the claim is time barred and that's it. Now that isn't the end of the story because um, the Supreme Court considered the uh, Athens limitation period again more recently um, in the case, uh, Scottish case of Warner and Scarpa Flow Charters. Now this was a case concerning a child claimant and just like the English rules, um, the Scottish rules postpone the start of a limitation period for children. And the claimant argued that this rule um, was a suspension of the limitation period and therefore provided a child claimant with additional time to bring a claim. And the Supreme Court agreed with that and held that the um, grounds for suspension of the limitation period in Article 16.3 were wide enough to cover domestic rules which postpone the start of the limitation period, as well as, as rules which stop the clock after the limitation period has begun. So this means uh, in the cases of a disability postponing the start of the limitation period, there is the possibility of some more time under Athens. But 
it's important to be very careful about that because um, if we're able to go back to the slide about Article 16.3, it's not simply a case of suspending and interrupting a limitation period potentially indefinitely, because if you look at the bottom half of that slide, uh, there is a long stop. And I say a long stop, but it's really more accurate would be to say a short stop, because the, uh, the, uh, the long stop is five years after disembarkation at the latest, but if earlier, three years from the date of knowledge of the injury, loss or damage caused by the incident. So in reality, in most cases, you're not going to have some delayed date of knowledge. And even if there is some additional time because the payment's under disability, it's probably not going to be more than three years from the accident. So um, even with that caveat about some additional time for children, people under disability, this is a very strict and short uh, limitation period and a major pitfall um, that, that everybody practicing in this area needs to be well aware of. The final um, thing I'm going to say on this topic relates to um, where this sits with contribution claims. And this takes me back to the case of Feast that I uh, referred to earlier. And um, the reason why I mention this again is because um, just to remind you what the facts were in Feast, we have a claimant bringing a non-Athens claim against her employer uh, before three years were up, but after two years were up. The employer sought to bring in the carrier, who was essentially responsible for what had happened on board. But the carrier argued it was too late to bring the carrier in, and that um, it was too late for the um, defendant to bring them in as a third party because it was more than two years after this embarkation, and that therefore the claimant's claim against them was time barred and it was too late for contribution claim to happen too. Essentially because the contribution claim depended on the carrier having a liability to the claimant, they argued that once the limitation period had passed, the carrier no longer has any liability to the claimant, um, meaning that there was nothing essentially for the contribution to attach to. Um, this uh, turns on to quite a technical issue, which is um, whether the limitation period is remedy barring, like most limitation periods, or whether it was right extinguishing. If the limitation period was right extinguishing, then after two years had passed, it would be too late for a contribution claim. If it was remedy, remedy barring, then it wouldn't be. And of course, for the defendant in that case, it would be quite a unfortunate result if the limitation period was right extinguishing, because in those circumstances, it would never have been possible for the employer to bring in the carrier, because it wasn't the employer's fault that they were sued more than two years after disembarkation. The claim had a longer limitation period against them than against the carrier. And um, after a lot of debate, the Court of Appeal have held that the limitation period is remedy barring rather than right extinguishing. And this means that um, you can still bring a contribution claim more than two years after disembarkation, even if the uh, claimant's limitation period has gone, because this doesn't actually extinguish the claimant's right, then um, the uh, scope is still there for a contribution claim. And this also means that if the defendant doesn't raise an Athens limitation period, then the court's still able to give the claimant damages because the claimant still has the right. Uh, it's the remedy that's potentially barred if that's raised by the defendant. So I think that's highly unlikely to ever happen in practice. I'm going to return you back uh, to Sarah now, who's going to talk about shipping incidents. Thank you. Yes, uh, quite a lot of questions there, Andrew. You might just want to cast your eye over them um, and make sure that I'm right in what I've said in the answers, although I'm pretty sure I am, but then I would be, wouldn't I? Um, I okay, so the all the questions is... very efficiently as well, so thank you very much for that. No worries. Um, the nature of event, once you've established that there is jurisdiction and that the claim is within limitation, you need to identify the nature of the event that's being complained of because there are different regimes for different types of events and 
what the type of event is that gives rise to the claim will determine or may determine limits of liability and whether or not the claim is defensible. So it's important to look at the two different regimes completely separately effectively. Um, is it a shipping incident or is it an incident caused by fault or neglect on the part of the carrier? Or I might add, is it a shipping incident caused by fault or neglect on the part of the carrier? So is it a hybrid? Um, and the importance of, of that distinction um, becomes apparent uh, when we look at the um, damages that can be recovered. So where the loss is caused by shipwreck, capsizing, collision or stranding of the ship, explosion or fire in the ship or defect in the ship, which I'll come back to in a moment, the claimant can recover up to 25,000 SDRs. A special drawing right is a particular unit of currency used in international conventions. It's about one-to-one -one with pounds. So it's about 250,000 pounds we're talking about, unless the carrier shows that the incident occurred due to act of war or God or international act by a third party, intentional rather, act by a third party. And then the claimant goes on to recover more than that, or a million pounds odd, unless the carrier shows the incident was not due to fault or neglect on his part. So you need to, first of all, determine whether you're looking at a shipping incident um, or whether you're just looking at a slipping incident, for example. We were asked a question by uh, Catherine Alexander about the current manoeuvring in the Aegean by the uh, Turkish fleet. And for those who are, are not up to date on their Greek-Turkish relations, um, there's an escalating problem in the Aegean, which we can talk about a little bit later from an international law point of view. But suffice to say that there is an ongoing um, battle, really, legal battle, between Greece and Turkey about international law relating to who owns what bits of the Aegean, um, which centres around uh, ownership of seas around islands, effectively, as opposed to mainland. Um, but suffice to say that the Turkish um, Navy is toddling around the Aegean and occasionally colliding with the Greek Navy. Um, if that were to happen with a passenger ship, and if that collision were to cause uh, an injury to a passenger on board that ship, um, you might be looking at a very unusual defence, which would be, you could either say that was an act of war by the Turkish Navy, or more likely an intentional act by a third party. Um, so you would have a potential defence there as a carrier in relation to a shipping incident, which is quite unusual. Um, but yeah, that's a possibility. So yeah, if it's a shipping incident, there is a different legal regime um, to if it's a straightforward uh, incident. If it's a shipping incident, um, then you have to give under the European regulation, but not under the Merchant Shipping Act, so post-Brexit this may be different, the carrier has to give uh, an interim payment, which is not less than €21,000. And that is whether or not liability is contested. So it's quite in, that's quite an important um, feature of the regulation, which wasn't in um, the Act. So that is of importance and may be different after Brexit. In relation to defects in the ship, and this is where we come to the Darius question of the day, um, the only Darius question of the day, um, what does defect in a ship mean? Um, how can a claimant show, because of the defendant, uh, the claimant rather, to show that this is uh, an accident that's risen as a result of a defect in the ship and then the burden of proof shifts to the carrier, as I say. Um, we've had a number of cases on this um, and in a norovirus uh, context, is a failure to um, grapple with norovirus, a, and of course we'll, we'll look at this with coronavirus later, no doubt, does that constitute a defect in the ship? Because the um, soft furnishings, for example, of the ship may be contaminated with norovirus and it may be that the crew is not um, using proper health and hygiene procedures. We've had two diametrically opposed decisions about that, which is not terribly helpful. Swift and Nolan, one of which held that norovirus was capable, the judge thought, although it wasn't determinative, of being a defect in the ship, didn't need to determine that issue uh, as it happened. And the other of which said, no, don't be ridiculous, of course, it's not a defect in the ship. Oh, Andrew's joined us, how exciting, he's here. So yeah, I'm just saying, um, in Swift, it was thought that norovirus on the ship was capable of being a defect. In Nolan, it was thought that it wasn't. Um, but that's a Nolan's Court of Appeal, but it doesn't actually address that issue. 
Now, the Darius question for today goes further than that and asks whether unseaworthiness constitutes a defect in the ship. And at first blush, you think that it does, because a ship being unseaworthy, of course, would make it defective. But actually, the way that unseaworthiness is classified seems to me um, to lead to the conclusion that it doesn't necessarily, which is a real lawyer's answer. And the reason for that is that the a ship can be unseaworthy as a result of things like uh, failure to implement a health and safety plan, um, things like in the Libra litigation, which is still ongoing, it's going to the Supreme Court at the moment. That was um, an erroneous chart, which led to the ship running aground before it passed, you know, five minutes into the journey. Um, and the reason was the chart didn't show um, a, a, a proper sounding, I think it was. So Darius will tell me. Um, and it seems to me that a defect in a chart, although it might be capable of rendering um, a ship unseaworthy within the common law and within arguments as between uh, uh, commercial entities, doesn't, I think, render a ship defective within the meaning of the convention. And the reason I say that is that defects in the ship is actually defined within the convention. And as I keep stressing and saying to people every time they ask me a question, don't forget the convention is a freestanding whole of itself um, legal and, and, and entire structure. And defect in the ship in this context means malfunction, failure, non-compliance with safety regulations in respect of a part of the ship, its equipment, and you can see the equipment they're talking about when used for propulsion, steering, navigation, mooring, anchoring, and so on. Um, I think you'd really struggle to bring a, a, a mistake in a chart within that definition for the purpose of the convention. So in answer to your question, um, Darius, I think the answer is no. Unseaworthiness and defect are two totally different concepts and you can't transport one uh, into the other. But it's an interesting question that, as far as I know, has never been answered, and certainly not in the higher courts. So if the loss is not caused by a shipping defect, uh, or a shipping incident, rather, within the meaning of the convention, the claimant has to prove fault or neglect on the part of the carrier. We've put Dawkins and Par Carnival in there as an example of that. This is slipping on orange juice, I think. And this is a case in which the court asked itself whether or not Ward and Tesco stores would be relevant. Um, it's not, it seems to us, in, in the context of the convention because it's a freestanding convention. Um, Dawkins and Carnival is actually quite a useful um, case in, in relation to what you need to prove and how you need to prove it. So the carrier in that case had shown that there was a, um, a system of cleaning up spillages, but had not called a member of crew to give evidence as regards how that system was implemented. And that was a fail on the part of the carrier. And that, it seems to me, is a really harsh decision because it's very hard to bring crew. Um, and anyone who's run one of these um, for a defendant will be able to tell you that whatever a crew member is doing in sort of 2017, they're not going to be doing the same thing in 2020. And if they are, they could be anywhere in the world. Um, and it is difficult to bring the relevant members of crew to say, I implemented the orange juice spillage um, system of work. So Dawkins Carnival are actually quite a difficult case to grapple with, I think, in this context. Of course, if there's fault or neglect on the part of the claimants, we can um, then raise contributory negligence, uh, and that is then considered in accordance with the law of the form, forum in which the claim is brought. So in, within our forum, if claims are brought within England and Wales, it would be for the carrier to raise and prove fault or neglect on the part of the passenger, and then um, any damages claim would be reduced, could be reduced 100% uh, in relation to uh, the nature of the fault and the extent of the fault on the part of the passenger. Now, what are the uh, measures uh, of damages? Um, there are limitations, as I say, under the convention. So under Article 7.1, um, liability of the passenger for the death of or personal injury, uh, liability carrier for the death of or personal injury to a passenger um, will not exceed 400,000 SDRs, so special drawing rights. As I say, it's about one to one per passenger on each distinct uh, occasion, although the carrier and passenger may agree on higher limits. Interest and costs are not included within that. So the limit on liability is 400,000 special drawing rights in relation to claims brought under the Athens Convention, as all of these have to be, unless 
it is proved by the claimant that the damage resulted from an act or omission done with intent to cause damage or recklessly and with knowledge that such damage would probably result. That's quite a high threshold. So the carrier has to be both reckless, i.e. the claimant can prove that the carrier just did not care, and as well as that, knowing damage would probably, not possibly, result. So it's not good enough to say, well, um, the carrier doesn't have uh, or implement safety policies. That has to be done recklessly. Now, you might prove that, but it would be difficult, I think, to show that the carrier knew that the relevant damage would probably, as opposed to possibly, result. So it's a high, um, high threshold to get past. So for most purposes, the claims under the Athens Convention will be limited to 400,000 special drawing rights. What is the applicable law in relation to the measure of damages? As I say and keep saying, the Convention is an island entire of itself. It doesn't tell us how to quantify damages. And so as a result, the law of the forum where the claim is brought is deployed in assessing the value of the claim. And that's something that there's no authority about, either within the Convention uh, or within the higher authorities, but it's just something that we all do. Um, so if a claim is brought within um, the Forum of England and Wales, it will be determined in terms of quantum by way of what we would normally do in England and Wales. So you would look at the Judicial College guidelines on pain, suffering, loss of meaning, and, um, immunity and so on. Now this um, raises a number of, of questions. Can you get punitive or exemplary damages, for example, which you can in some circumstances uh, within England and Wales, although they're very limited? No, you can't. Um, Article 3 tells us that. Can you recover for loss of enjoyment and diminution in value uh, of the cruise holiday? Now this is actually a question uh, that was raised by Mark Fanning. It's a really interesting question because those heads of loss arise as a result of operation of contract law. These claims are not being brought in contract law, they're being brought under the convention and the convention itself doesn't help us with that. Um, I think the probable answer to that, um, although there's no authority on it, is that claimants can recover for loss of enjoyment and diminution in value of the cruise holiday. The reason being that the underlying contract, which gives rise to the relationship between the passenger and the carrier, is a contract for enjoyment. So if it were not for the application of the convention, if you brought a claim under contract, you'd get those heads of loss. And I think that the court would be quite keen to allow you to recover for them, although that is a fudge. Um, and as a matter of strict uh, interpretation, um, because it's not a contractual claim, um, the courts probably should not allow you to recover for that. But I suspect they would actually, as a result of the whole context that we're looking at, at the claim in, which I accept is not a terribly helpful um, answer to that. Now, the interrelationship with the Hague Visby rules is rather like the international law questions raised by the Greek Turkish argument outside the scope of this webinar, but we were asked a question about it by Michael Hughes um, from Charles Taylor. Um, for those not familiar with the Hague Visby rules, these are the rules that cover carriage of goods by sea um, as opposed to carriage um, by passengers by sea, but sometimes you will get an overlap between the two. So for example, the example that Michael used was where somebody uh, accompanies goods um, on a vessel. So for example, the Athens Convention covers car ferries. If you are a lorry driver and you accompany your goods onto the ferry, get out of your lorry um, and subsequently slip, for example, within the confines of the ship, um, you're going to be covered by the Athens Convention because there is a contract for carriage there uh, and you're a passenger within it. But if uh, something some disaster happens and the goods that you're carrying in your trailer are all completely destroyed, the Hague Visby rules are going to apply to that. And the Hague Visby rules pr provide for a measure of damages, which is entirely different to the Athens Convention. So they provide for um, damages per kilo in relation to carriage of goods um, subject to, to other uh, provisions of it. So if you're, if you're a passenger accompanying goods, which, uh, to which the Hague Visby rules apply, there is going to be a hybrid situation where an injury to the passenger under the contract of carriage is going to be governed by the convention and uh, damage to the goods um, are going to be covered by the Hague Visby rules. So there is an interrelationship there. To be perfectly honest, we don't see very many of these, but it is a, a theoretical possibility. 
Practical considerations, let me just have a look at the time. Yes, we're still within time. I've got three minutes to give you some practical considerations. Um, this is a question that Sandeep was asking about. Um, the claim falls within Section 20 of the Senior Courts Act, so it must be brought within the Admiralty Division. And this is something that uh, Miles Fanning actually uh, was pioneering yonks and yonks ago. If a claim is brought in the county court, it has to be either transferred to the Admiralty Court or struck out. There is no middle ground. The county court can't keep it. If the county court keeps hold of the claim and does not transfer it or strike it out, everything done thereafter is a nullity in the action. So if a claimant brings a claim in the county courts, if the defendant doesn't take the point, and if then the matter proceeds to judgment, for example, that judgment is a nullity because the court never had jurisdiction to hear the matter. So claims of this nature have to be brought in the Admiralty um, Court. If they are brought in the County Court, they're usually transferred. So there's, you know, there's not much um, to be gained by saying the defence, well, you've brought it in the wrong court and therefore it should be struck out. What I tend to say in defences is, is you've brought it in the wrong court, it's got to be transferred and we're not paying the costs of that. And we're not paying the costs of our considering this, but the costs are minimal. Um, so it's got to be brought within the Admiralty Court because it relates to the operation of a ship. And almost all cases with a watery feel have to be brought in the Admiralty Court. Um, although I came across one the other day, which doesn't, because it doesn't fall within section 22. But if you've got anything that's a little bit watery, have a look at section 20 because it's it's really strict it has to be brought um as i keep saying the amity courts as regards practical considerations in relation to the claim form and this was a question that was raised by sue coles what do you have to say in the brief details of claim you should make reference to the convention um in cairns and northern lighthouse one of the reasons that the defendant failed in its attempt to get the Athens Convention to operate was that they had not referred to the convention in the defense. So at no point had they actually raised the operation of the convention itself. So you've got to mention it if you are trying to bring a claim uh, under the convention. And I think that's fairly um, well established now. In Adams and Thompson Holidays, this is a case um, with which actually I was involved with Mars Fanning. Um, and this is 11 years ago now, which is hard to believe. But this was one of a rash of cases in which we were arguing that because the claim had been brought in the wrong court, it was a nullity. Um, the county court just transferred it to the Admiralty Court. And we said, well, OK, but you've got the wrong people. You've sued the wrong people. And you haven't uh, mentioned the Athens Convention in your pleading. His own Judge Waxman actually allowed the claimant to amend their pleading, to plead against the proper party uh, and to plead the Athens Convention. But it actually seems to me that after Cairns and Northern Lighthouse, that probably wouldn't happen now. So be careful with these um, cases because this is a developing area of law as regards to practical considerations. But you should be, as, as with everything, where you are arguing something that, under a cause of action, you should be making mention of what that cause of action is. Um, and in this case, the convention, it should be uh, mentioned uh, in the claim form. Now, that's been a really brief canter through. I'm just checking to see that we've answered all the questions that we had previously. I know that Andrew will have been answering questions as we've been going through. But we've cantered really quickly through these um, provisions. We've come in at 11.46, so we've come in at 45 minutes, which actually isn't bad given the breadth of this. But any questions you may have, please feel free to raise them now. Andrew, have you been answering questions? I have been. I've been. Um, I've answered several questions while you were talking. Uh, Marvelous. My answers and see if you're happy with them. Um, I'm currently dealing with something about um, a potential claim against the state of Turkey if they were to attack a ship. Um, uh, identify that wouldn't be a claim under Athens, but theoretically there could be a claim like that. And in terms of enforcement, I, my recollection is that there's been attempts to enforce for the Lockerbie case against assets belonging to the Libyan government that were in this jurisdiction. So although I said um, a bit facetiously that enforcement might be difficult if we were in a state of war with Turkey, I suppose the, you know, the Turkish government no doubt does have assets that are in this jurisdiction that you could enforce against. So I think that would be a possibility. I very much hope we never have to actually <laughs> ask that, answer that question in practice. Yeah, I mean, it should be said that in relation to the Greek-Turkish question, um, Turkey has a completely different interpretation of international law and the, the limits of their um, sea space to, to Greece. And it all centres around, um, I think it's Cypriot um, international waters. So whether or not the um, continental shelf 
gives rise to a claim, whether or not islands have a claim or mainlands have a claim. Because the, the oddity of it with Greece and Turkey is that although Turkey has thousands of kilometers of coastline, they don't have international waters because when we carved up that area in the 19, by, by which I mean Lloyd George, carved up that area in the 1920s, um, Turkey really missed out because they were on the losing side of things. So there is a, a question of international law, which is probably beyond the scope of this webinar, thankfully, before we cause an international incident. Um, but there is a question, and Turkey would raise all manner of defences in international law. So it's probably for the best if we don't get into that, I suspect. Yes, and if we don't get into discussions about the extent to which countries are able to just deviate by, from international law through their own domestic legislation as well. Um, <laughs> Have we got any more questions? I'm just sorry, I'm just looking at the questions that you've we've already got, answered, Andrew. Yes, we've got two questions that are still open that have come in just uh, in the last couple of minutes. Okay, if I deal with Nick's, even though he trolled me earlier, if a food poisoning claim against Birdseye is brought where Captain Birdseye himself is joined as second defendant, must that claim be brought in the Admiralty Court? The answer to that is yes. Um, the reason being that it arises as a result of operation of a ship, I think. Um, but I've never looked at um, section 22 um, with regard to who the applicable defendant was. So I've never had a situation where I've represented an individual. Um, so I've concentrated on the, the nature of the claim as regards whether it arises from operation of a ship. I haven't concentrated on the defendant, but I think the answer is yes. It doesn't Not seem to be that, Andrew. Yeah, well, it doesn't seem to me that an additional defendant would prevent you having to issue the claim against the carrier in the Admiralty. Court. Yeah, you would have to issue against carrying the um, yeah. You know, Athens is very clear about that. So in the context of practical considerations and akin to issuing in the wrong court, what in your experience is the attitude as to whether the wrong type of claim form is used? So if you've used an N1 as opposed to an ADM1 or ADM1A, um, the Admiralty Court is actually really hot on that stuff. Um, I actually had a claim dismissed because we'd used the wrong form in the Admiralty Court. And because um, we had waited until the end of the limitation period, that was the end of that, which is rather unfortunate. Um, so the Admiralty Court will return your attempt to issue if you issue on the wrong form. The other thing is that the Admiralty Court has its own very particular procedure. If you don't follow it, they just don't do it. Um, computer says no. So you if, if the claim's actually been in, so the, was the problem in your case, Sarah, that the claim had not actually been issued because the court wouldn't process it because the form was wrong? Yeah. Not, but it had been issued using the wrong form. Because I think if you were in that situation, then I anticipate the argument would be quite similar to if you have issued in the wrong court. It doesn't actually make the underlying proceedings and technicality if it's something that the court can correct. I don't know. I think maybe if you use the wrong, court, it, wrong form, it might render it a nullity because of the way the Amity Court interprets its... Um, they have very, very particular rules. They're actually really helpful um, if you ring them up. But it, it's one of those cases where if you are bringing a claim in the Amity Court and you're not used to bringing cases like this, you need to look at the rule and completely assure yourself that you're familiar with it, I think. Because it's an area where there are so many pitfalls, not just the, you know, I've had cases where you've had um, limitation periods being met, but then you've had the wrong court or some other procedural problem. And um, I think sometimes the temptation is to think, I've got the limitation period right, so I don't need to worry about anything else. But, but as Sarah's saying, that really, that really isn't the case. And, you know, at best, it's going to be a costly exercise to correct it. Yeah. Uh, Darius is pointing out to us, it might be worth mentioning direct right against insurers. Um, I don't think we have a direct right against insurers, do we? Except, unless you're meaning um, by the carrier. Let me just have a look at the chat as well. Uh, okay, in relation to a claim against Christy, can still wants to bring a claim against Turkey. Oh yeah, no, I started. He he put that in a while ago. I started to answer it, and then we 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 asked it live instead. Okay. I started typing something about possibilities of enforcing against dot dot dot. I was going to say assets in, in this jurisdiction. Maybe I can stop the completion. <laughs> okay. 
All right, well, if nobody else has uh, any other questions. Oh, is that you on the chat, Andrew? That was me okay. just answering about Turkey. Yeah, I mean, I've, that is just your worst nightmare. Although Turkey, a Turkish warship did collide with a Greek, can't remember what it was, Greek naval ship um, a few weeks ago. So it kind of is happening, but if, I mean, if Turkey were to collide with a passenger ship, that would cause serious problems. There's already quite a massive um, group of people or group of nations um, who are in a sort of stop Turkey camp at the moment. I think if they collide with a passenger ship, that would be a mistake. It would be like um, the Germans sinking a, a vessel with a whole load of kids on it in the Second World War. Uh, it would be an equivalent to that. Okay, well, if there are no other questions, thank you all for coming. Um, next week, it's the Montreal Convention, which is a similar thing. Same, same topics. A lot of the Montreal and Athens cases um, go across each other, like Andrew was saying about CIDI. Um, that's a case that um, arose out of the Montreal Convention, but there are particular um, issues which arise as a result of the Montreal Convention in relation to bodily injury, which those of you who've read uh, my article with Scott Rigby um, from Stewart's will know I have a thing about bodily injury, so you'll be hearing a lot about that. And more limitation, a slightly different limitation regime and slightly different, well, quite different liability regime. So uh, Henk uh, Sode and I will be discussing that.